Proverbs 20, 24 says, Man's steps are ordained by the Lord. How then can man understand his way? If you've lived even for a short time on this planet, you know how difficult it is to understand why we behave the way we do. Well, that's the goal of this five-part series. We're going to take ourselves and put ourselves underneath the microscope to try to discover what makes us tick. Why did I just snap at my spouse with that snarky response? Why did I just finish that third bowl of ice cream when I promised myself I would watch what I eat? Why can't I talk to my son, but I can talk to my son's friends? Why do I get so mad at other drivers? And why am I so bitter sometimes? Again, from Proverbs chapter 25, verse 2, It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings is to search out a matter. Searching out this matter will be a most glorious adventure. Jesus encouraged us to ask and to seek and to knock. And every second we spend investing in knowledge, wisdom, and understanding in matters like this is going to prove for us to be profit as we become better and better servants for God. It's a worthy investment. And there's nothing in this world more complex than the, the highest creation of God, our own human beings, body, soul, and spirit. So let's take on this challenge and see if we can discover what makes us tick. Here, as a launch pad into this question, what is a soul? Let's spend a moment talking about Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we ask, would you please give us your spirit, help us understand better this whole matter, because we want to be better servants for you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. I came to Christ in 1980, and to be honest, I was desperate for help. I was a horrible person. My life was in shambles. I didn't understand why I did what I did. I couldn't control what I did, and this made me very frustrated, and I looked everywhere for help. I tried everything, but finally and eventually, I attended a conference by Josh McDowell, who was speaking at my university. He told me that Jesus Christ is my Savior. And so I went back to my dorm room that night, and I prayed and said, and said Jesus, if you're real, would you please show me? From that point on, my life changed drastically. I gave my life to Jesus as much as I knew how. I poured myself into God's word, and it changed my life completely. It was the answer I was looking for. Jesus was the answer. So I, from that point on, I was studying God's word, and eventually I got to the book of Hebrews chapter 4, and I hit this verse 12, and the verse just seemed to glow with a heavenly glow off the page. And I knew this verse would be something that was really important to me. And so I studied even harder to see if I could find in Scripture ways I could understand more about myself, my spirit and my soul, and how I, I was created, how I was going to tick, and how I could fix the problems in my life. This was very difficult for me, but I intensely studied it, and I wanted to know the answer, and I prayed about it constantly, and God has answered my prayers. Now, I am no expert. Uh, I'm not a professional. I am not a trained counselor. I'm not a, cha I'm not a, a psychologist or a psychologist. I'm not even a psychoanalyst. And I'm not even a philosopher either. But what I am is an engineer. I am a born-again, spirit-filled geek from the heart. And so I use this per perception to help me understand if I can fix what's going on in my body, in my soul, in my spirit to fix it all. I spend my days debugging complex systems of hardware, firmware, and software components. And if you want to be a debugger, there's two questions you need to find the answer to. The first one is, how is the system supposed to work? And the next question is, what is, what is it that exactly went wrong? If you know the answer to those two questions, you're well on your way because then you can formulate theories to explain why you possibly received the behavior that you did. What went wrong? You can use those theories to try to fix the system. Now, if you don't understand how it's supposed to work, then your theories are just going to be a waste of time. And if you don't know how to explain exactly what you're observing, then there's all your, all your theories are just going to be blind shots in the dark. So I approach this understanding of my own soul from this perspective. Has God revealed for us enough information to understand how we are supposed to work, and can we explain uh, or can we uh, describe what we are doing so we can feed it back into the system and come up with theories of why everything went wrong? Well, that's going to be the goal for this. If we do that, 
then our theories are going to be better and our fixes are going to be effective. Our first question to understand today is what is a soul? What is a soul? The concept of soul is introduced to us from Genesis chapters, chapter 1 on day 5 and day 6 of creation. God starts talking to us about souls. Now on day 3, God talks about the creation of trees and vegetables and, and plants, uh, but there's no mention of these having a soul. However, when we get to day 5, then when God talks about the swarming things of the sea and the flying things in the air, then he calls these creatures living souls, living souls. Listen to Genesis chapter 1, verse 20. Then God said, let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. And then again on day six, God creates the land animals. And this is how he describes those land animals again as living souls. Then God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth after their kind. And it was so. That's Genesis chapter 1, verse 24. Now, the next chapter, chapter 2, God kind of drills down, gives us a little more detail of some of the things that took place on day 6 during especially those moments when he was creating man in his own image. So if we turn to chapter 2, verse 7, you'll explain, God explains that man too was also a living soul. Listen to this. Then the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. All three of these verses that I've just read for you use the same Hebrew term, living souls. Living souls. It's the term nefesh. Now this term nefesh, uh, you can see the translators have kind of tried to do us a favor here. When nefesh is used in the context of an animal, then God uses, or the translators use the term living creature. However, when this nefesh is used in terms of describing uh, living mankind, then he uses the term uh, being, as a human being. But all the verses that we've just read all use the same term, living soul, living soul. Now, if you, this human equivalency with animals troubles you, then I just encourage you, just relax, it's okay. Uh, there is a huge difference between souls that were created for animals and souls that were created in the image of God. Souls created in the image of God have a lot more complexity. They have a moral component to them because God is a moral being. It also has the ability, these souls have the ability to have a relationship with a spiritual being, relationship with God as a personal relationship. So don't get, that, don't get all upset about that. Folks often point out that of those three verses we just read, it was only man who had the breath of life breathed in through his nostrils, and that's what made him special. Well, unfortunately, that's not true. If you turn to the time of the days of Noah, when the earth became so violent and corrupt that God had to kill all the people on the earth, it had become overrun with violence and corruption, and only Noah was provided that grace that would save him, and he was built an ark. And on, in chapter 7, in chapter 7, verse 15, it says... So they went into the ark to Noah by twos of all flesh in which was the breath of life. So Adam wasn't the only creature that God had created that also had within it the breath of life. Uh, the animals were also blessed with this breath of life. So again, there's still some sort of equivalency about the souls of men and the souls of animals. But of course, men were built in the, uh, created in the image of God. That's what makes us special. God is spirit. In fact, this word, breath of life, could also be called, translated, the spirit of life, the spirit of life. So one thing that is absolutely and solidly true in all the universe is that life only comes from God. From the spirit of God is what generates life. And nobody has ever proved anything to the contrary. Life always has come from God. Let's just make a few observations about what we've just read. Now, God's Word is not a psychology textbook. However, there are a few things that we can note about this passage that will help us understand more about souls. Notice that plants, animals, and mankind all have bodies. They all have bodies. And these bodies, as you know, if you've been through any sort of education, are the most complex and interesting bodies that we could ever imagine. Even plant life 
is so complex, so, in, so incredible, that God gets the glory for what he has made in creation. It's, it's, a, it's absolutely amazing. They all have the ability to grow, to sense the world around them, to heal themselves, to feed themselves, reproduce themselves, and much, much more. These, these bodies that these, all of us have are absolutely phenomenal. They're all based completely on a microscopic cellular DNA-centric cell which uh, built with mechanisms inside of there, built with just primitive uh, proteins and molecules that pull things together. There are little machines going on in your cell, but they are all mechanisms. They are beautiful mechanisms, wonderful mechanisms. But as noted before, plants do not have souls, but animals and mankind do have souls. So creatures that have souls have an additional layer of absolutely amazing behavioral complexity. They're capable of doing so much more. And there are scientists all over the world right now who are studying animal behavior. And what they're studying is animals' souls, animals' souls, the programming, and how they, are, how they automate themselves and take care of themselves. And with this study, there are still millions of unanswered questions. However, I believe that the Bible has many of those answers that we look for. Souls have within them built-in instincts there are survival instincts, there are reproductive instincts, there are social instincts, and this is all the programming of the soul that animates a body in a complex way. So everything that's not a plant, that's an animal or a mankind type of creature, uh, these things are very, very complex in their programming, and they have instincts that way. And so these souls that have these instincts seem to have the ability to be totally autonomous. They're totally autonomous. They can run on their own. They don't need any input from any other source. And don't you find it fascinating that there are birds and deer and squirrel and insects all around us right now, and they don't, we don't need to touch them. They just, they just take care of themselves. They show up next spring. They last through the winter. They're waterproof. They live outside. They can do everything they need, totally autonomous. They run on their own without anybody having to deal with them. They sing and they call with grace and beauty. They have utility. Uh, these are absolutely beautiful examples of how genius God is, that he can create creatures like this. Can you imagine any scientist or engineer getting together and creating an invention that can absolutely take care of itself and run on its own and reproduce itself and feed itself and heal itself when it's broken? Can you think of any man-invented invention that can get to that point in life? It's going to be impossible. Only God can do this, and especially to make it all out of organic materials. No, human beings like to make things out of, out of electronics and hard things and solid things. There's no organics in, in human inventions like this. It's all God's brilliance that can produce all this out of organic material. Well, don't hold your breath waiting for your cell phone to actually have uh, the ability to heal its own cracked screen. That's never going to happen. And don't hold your breath waiting for uh, buying a car that will have the tire tread grow back on it overnight while you feed it. That's not going to happen. This is how genius God is. They're autonomous creatures that God has made. And not only there's a couple of them, there are hundreds of them. There are thousands of them. They are in every variety. They live in every environment and every biome. Uh, God is a genius about life and creation. And, and, and creations that have a soul are even more impressive because they run so automatically. And finally, notice that God has created souls that are specific for every creature. There's a soul for every bird. There's a soul for every fish. There's a soul for every kind of animal. And so there's a strong tie between a soul and its body. They are tied together in a very specific way. The soul that was God created for a bear is a totally different soul than God created for a goldfish. Now, before we go on and finish this question of what is a soul, let's talk for a moment and see that this is actually a pattern of modern technology. It's a pattern of modern technology. When we ask the question, <clears throat> what is a soul, we'll take, for example, a mousetrap. A mousetrap. A mousetrap is a very interesting uh, creation. It's actually, it actually shows a very clear, careful uh, com uh, building of components, of intelligent design, form together and put together and cooperate with a purpose. A mousetrap is a very clever design. But does a mousetrap have a soul? No, it doesn't. Mousetraps do not have souls. Everything a mousetrap does is done out of a total physical mechanism. There's no programming of behavior to it. It's just a physical mechanism. In God's creation, there are 
plants. Plants kind of fall into this category of being merely physical mechanisms. They're just engineering of machinery going on and taking care of itself with a physical mechanism. But there's no animation to a plant. It's just a physical uh, physical. Uh, it's just a physical mechanism. It's purely physical. Look at lawn turf. Isn't that amazing? Apples, algae, and roses. All these are such great examples of some of the most amazing mechanisms that God could ever imagine, we could ever imagine God to make. Wow. You know, when I was growing up, I remember the invention of the automatic clothes washer. The automatic clothes washer. Before the automatic clothes washer, a housewife had to stand there and scrub their clothes and then wring them out, wash them and rinse them and wring them out and do all this thing over and over. Very manual task. But I remember when the automatic clothes washer came out and it was, and when it was first made, it clearly only a mechanism. It was driven through all of its courses of washing and rinsing and spinning by merely mechanisms. There was a timed gear and it had cogs and wheels and solenoids and little transmission gears and belts and pulleys to make all this happen, but it was purely a mechanism. There are so many mechanisms like that. I remember that early, you remember the early calculators were all merely mechanisms. Typewriters were all just mechanisms, but that is all advanced now. We have calculators that are electronic now that actually think and program themselves. We have typewriters that can do amazing things for us. Uh, we don't even use typewriters because we have computers that act as typewriters for us, that think for us and, and spell check for us and do all that type of stuff. There are even computerized things today that can interface with uh, us better and interface with other inventions together. So uh, human beings are trying their hardest to come up with souls for machines around us that, so that they, we can cooperate and interface with them. If we can create a machine that acts like a soul would act, then we would get along with that machine really well. It becomes an intuitive acting machine and we can deal with it quite easily. Now, there are some uh, mechanisms even, or some, some of these souls that are in our houses right now. I'm not going to say the words of them, but you know what I'm talking about. You can actually speak to them, and they will speak back to you. This is the advancement of mankind. They are, mankind is so trying, so hard, to make a soul, an artificial soul, but it is so, so difficult. Will, will Commander Data ever be a reality? Will C-3PO really be a possibility? I don't think so. We're never going to create life anywhere, anytime uh, soon, because life, remember, only comes from God and from His Spirit. Mankind is desperate to create a soul. So that's what a soul is. But what we really care about is what about our soul? So let's go back to basics again and talk about our soul. First of all, do we have a soul? Do we even have a soul? Well, of course, the quick answer is yes, we do have a soul. In fact, this study is going to help us understand that not only do we have a soul, but we're going to discover that that soul is probably the most forceful and influential part of our beings, and yet we don't even notice it sometimes. If you are an academic sort of person, you look for an academic uh, definition of what a human being is, you might see a definition that looks a little bit like this. A human is the only being able to contemplate the nature of its own soul. Surprisingly, humans who have this ability to contemplate their own soul are uh, woefully non-self-aware. They do not even, they're not even aware of their own soul. Their soul acts and works in them, forcing them to do things all the time. They don't even realize that they're being driven by the powers and influences of their own soul. They think they're acting responsibly and logically and rationally, but no, it's actually their souls inside of them acting emotionally and responding emotionally all the time, which make people uh, work and behave the way they do. We're going to get more into that as this study goes on. You know, as a starting point, we need to picture a sort of like a wedge that we can drive between the me part of us and the my soul part of us. So just for a second, think of yourself as being a apartment building which has a little bitty uh, roommate in it and a, who talks and thinks and, and, uh, and says a lot. And then there's also a very large but quiet roommate living in that same apartment. Think of yourselves as that kind of a picture. And that's just a starting point. It's not an exact science, but just think of that as a starting point. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talked about life quite a bit. But when Jesus turned and talked about things like worry and anxiety, then he, he considered those a matter of the soul. For example, listen to Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, and you'll get an idea of what I'm talking about. 
For this reason, I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? In both these instances above, the word life there is actually the Greek word under the covers, the word suki, and that is better translated soul. Your survival, danger, and protection instincts of your soul will cause your mind and your spirit to obsess over these matters until, it is, until your soul becomes comfortable that you've solved the problem for it. Your soul is looking out for you to take care of you, and it will make your mind obsess over these matters until, it be finds, until your soul finds comfort. If that means hoarding, if that means collecting, if that means being anxious about it, you're going to be anxious about it until that problem is solved. However, Jesus is telling us right here, he's giving truth to our spirits that we can pass along to our souls and say, hey, soul, God is going to take care of us. He's going to abundantly supply and give us available resources right from his riches. He is going to take care of us and lavishly spend those for our benefit because we are far more important than all these things. He wants our lives to be taken care of. And so soul, you can calm down. You can be at peace. You don't have to be anxious and worry about this because God's going to take care of it all. You're going to find peace and tranquility in your soul when your soul then accepts this promise from God and who he is and what he's told us to do. You can trust God's promise. Activate your faith and tell, tell your soul, hey, we've, we're putting our faith in a person which is going to take care of us. God will take care of us. And souls will calm down when they receive promises like this. Now there's an automatic purpose for our soul. Our souls were given to us by God with power to automate so many things. He is the best helper that we could ever imagine. Our souls can do so much more than we actually believe they can because they are so complex. God has given us amazing souls. How many times have you needed a pen and you thought to yourself, wow, I think I, I can't find a pen, but I think there's one in my bedroom on the dresser. So you march across the room, you march across the hallway, you go and navigate the furniture, you arrive in your bedroom and you look and you say, now why did I want to come here? I can't remember. It was to get that pen, but you were able to walk all the way across the house and get into your bedroom without even any conscious involvement. You just gave your, your soul a command and off your soul went and it took you all the way to your bedroom. And when you get there, you, you've been so daydreaming and distracted about other things that you forgot even why you were going into that room at all. Well, that's how complex souls are. You can delegate services to your soul and they will take care of it. They will just manage it. They will walk it through you freely. I don't know how many times I've jumped in the car headed off to the grocery store to buy something, and then lo and behold, I discover I find myself turning into the parking lot at my office. My soul has driven me to the office so many thousands of times that if I get in the car, my soul will just say, oh, I know what we're doing next. I'll just take him to the office. That's what I'm supposed to. It was able to navigate the traffic signals and the traffic cars around me and the, the stop signs and stay in this lane and make the right turn signals and all this sort of stuff. And I was just uh, thinking about something else, listening to music or listening to an audio book. And when I arrive at my destination, I usually turn and say, thank you, soul, for getting me here. This time, I want to go to the grocery store. So now I have to get in the car and I have to say, okay, soul, we're going to the grocery store. We're going to the grocery store. And then my soul will help me along the way again, like it always does. It likes being helpful. It likes being cooperative. And it will take care of you. It will get you to the grocery store if you, pl if you plan for it that way. How many times have you picked up your phone and started typing an email into a form in that little text field and you get a couple letters into that email address and suddenly it pops up a little suggestion that says, do you want me to fill in the rest of it for you? And you say, yes, thank you. That was so convenient, Mr. Phone. You know, souls are doing the very same thing for us. The soul is always looking out for how it can be more helpful. It's always trying to figure out a pattern of normal. We didn't ask it to look for this, but it's always doing it automatically. It's looking for a pattern of what is normal in our lives. And if we stick to a routine, if we stick to a pattern of normal, uh, our souls can help us out. In fact, we love normal. We fall in love with normal. We resist change because it's so devastating to the normal pattern that our soul likes to remember. Uh, whenever there's a day where something's different, we have to really struggle hard to make sure you remember to do all the things you're supposed to do on those different days. Otherwise, we'll just go through our lives without any conscious involvement, and the pattern of normal will just be fulfilled by the power of our soul. This is so amazing. 
Souls gravitate to a path of normal, and they love the path of normal. If you lose normal, if you lose your job, if you, something interrupts your normal, it is really difficult for your soul to bounce back and recover from that. We don't even know what to do because we don't have any automatic plan to help us out with it. Our souls take care of those things so automatically for us. Now, you don't need to raise your hand here, but how many of you have caught yourself while you're singing a hymn in church and you're actually thinking about what you're going to have for lunch afterwards. Even though you're singing the song, might even be able to sing in harmony and know all the words, your mind is off thinking about something else. Your soul is actually able to take care of what your voice says, what your words say, and how to sing it, everything like that. And souls love doing that. It loves doing that. So that you can free your mind up for doing other things. I wouldn't recommend that. I would really want you to engage your entire spirit and your soul in your worship experience but how many people have done that? I know you've done it. I've done it as well. Now, souls automatically also help us with relationships. Souls have built-in social networking. Uh, we think that was just because of social media today. No, social media is patterned after our own social networking built into our souls. We love being around other people. We love making friends. We love having teams. We love being uh, acquaintances. We love have common missions. We love working together. In fact, there's parts of our soul that are on the lookout for what? a soulmate, right? Somebody that can share life with your soul and help you raise children and form families. Uh, our souls are built in with that desire within them. That's the automated nature of our souls. It's part of the instinctual programming that goes into our souls. Next, let's talk a little bit about personality and temperament. Personality and temperament. Now, if you let your soul have direct access to your tongue, and most of us have done that, we've given authority to our souls to talk for us and respond for us. And if you give our souls responsibility, uh, the ability to, talk, to use your muscles, you're going to find out that our entire personality and temperament will shine through because of the nature of our souls. We'll often say, how are you, to somebody? And we don't really care what the answer is. We just have no, that's part of the instinctual process of the protocols of life. We'll say, how are you? And they'll say, fine, I'm fine, everything's good. And souls will actually march us through all the social protocols and take care of everything without even missing a beat. Occasionally, you'll actually get one-on-one -on -one with something and somebody and you'll have to wake up and start engaging your spirit so that you have a dedicated, intensely personal conversation with somebody. You won't just talk about the weather. You won't just talk about uh, sports. You'll talk about something that's really personal. That will take you outside of the automatic temperament and personality that your soul provides for you. And it will get you so you we're working more on an individual basis. In fact, most of your personality is guided by your soul, the way you respond to others, your vocabulary, your earnestness, your inflection, your tone, your little uh, body language that you use is all driven by your soul. And what kind of a personality you have is given by your soul. All the ticks, all the nuances, all the things that you do uh, are coming from uh, your soul. Now think about a good actor. What is a good actor? A good actor is somebody who can then substitute uh, a whole nother feeling inside of them for the moment and let all the outside cues of, that usually come from a person's soul come out from that actor. And that actor is a convincing actor with the more he can make all the little things that our souls do uh, to express themselves come out of that actor. The quivering lip, the cracking voice, nervous pacing around the room, wringing hands, darting eyes. These are all little ticks and motions that are body language of our, of our souls that our souls pick up on so that we know how that other soul is feeling. That actor is able to communicate with our soul through their performance. Uh, very internal agonies that are going on in people's lives are seen on the wrinkles of their faces and how they talk in their voice. And we then share that experience with them because our souls pick up what their souls are experiencing. And it can be done entirely without words. Souls don't have to use words. Souls use pictures. Souls use images. Souls use a lot of things, music and sound. Next, let's talk about the adaptability of the soul. The soul is highly adaptable. It is amazing how adaptable souls are. And this can be both good and disastrous. Souls will adapt to everything it comes into. They will work around it. They will make sure that life goes on. They will, they will figure out how normal can be again. And they will go on with life. However, 
There's a special kind of programming that goes on to make this sort of a change happen. It's a special programming of their soul. Uh, when you meditate or when you stew or when you, uh, when you uh, meditate on something and it causes you to get really anxious, this is actually the reprogramming of your soul and how to get around the situations of life and accommodate the problems of life. When this, pro when this programming because of a deep uh, soulful pain, then sometimes this programming develops a scar. And people fairly often don't realize just how much scars affect their outward social behavior. Scars in the past can affect a lot of the things that we do and can give us some really hard responses in social situations. So watch out for scars. Be aware that scars might be gathering inside of you to the point where it's starting to affect your outward behavior. If that's happening, uh, you'll find out that other people will notice it before you do. So watch out about scars. But when the programming is due to something that's a positive discipline in your life, if that kind of reprogramming is happening, then that positive discipline of reprogramming is actually going to be beneficial and make you a better person uh, through it. It can, be, it can make you more helpful and productive. Your soul wants to be helpful and productive, and sometimes it's going to take discipline in order to move your soul into a program state where it can actually be more productive. Now talk to any soldier who's been to boot camp, and, they'll, and you ask him, did you like boot camp? And they'll all say, no, I, don't, I didn't like boot camp. But then you ask him, well, <clears throat> did you enjoy the result of boot camp? Were you positively changed by boot camp? And they all say, yes, yes, it had a positive effect on my life. It made me a better person, a better person of character. When your soul is programmed to cooperate with the world and the nature around you that God has programmed of his own moral character into the world around us, when your soul cooperates with that, it's going to be a more uh, powerful and more effective and helpful soul. That's what we all want in our lives. Uh, there are things that are gonna, we have to watch out for. We'll get to that in the future. But this discipline is something that's very powerful. And speaking of power, let's talk about the power of the soul. The power of the soul. When it comes to the power of the soul, we often underestimate how powerful our souls are. They are extremely powerful. And what I want you to picture is a picture, a giant Caribbean cruise ship. You've seen these cruise ships, deck after deck after deck with places of, of, uh, of, video, of gaming and amusement parks and hundreds of dining rooms and places and theaters. These, these, these things are huge. This giant uh, cruise ship, though, is directed from a little spot way up on the front side of this, this ship called the bridge. And in that bridge is a little bitty captain, really, really small, and this captain is responsible for the behavior and action that goes on with this ship. So you think this, he thinks he's in control, but is he really in control? Imagine this captain says, okay, it's time to turn left. He gives out the signal, hard to port. And what's going to happen? Well, at first, nothing's going to happen. And then slowly, over time, over the course of many miles, that ship is slowly going to turn around to the left and eventually obey his command. But it's not going to do it. On a, it's not going to just stop on a dime and take a left turn. What's going to happen if the ship does that? The ship has got so much inertia. It's so massive, so large that it is going to continue on in its normal path until it has to move. That's what the captain told it to turn left. And the captain is going to be a wise and understanding captain if he understands this dynamic. If that ship did turn left on a dime, it would have tipped over. It would have dumped its thousands of passengers into the sea. It would have flipped over all the dining room tables and all the shuffleboard games, and all the deck chairs would have been lost. So you don't want a ship to make rapid changes. Souls are big. They have got inertia, and they're powerful, and the wise captain understands this, pro this, uh, this problem. He'll understand that that's how you deal with a big ship, and that's how we should deal with our souls as well. So who is in charge of your life? Who's really in charge of your life? The next time you're forced to make a change, just to ask you, just, just look and see how easy that is. It's not going to be easy. Souls fight change, they, and they're, they have a very strong fight to them. Is it going to be easy or hard? Uh, try to lose weight. Try to cut back on your eating. Try to exercise more. Who's going to win that battle? Oh, you're going to have to do a lot of hard work to change your soul to get that to happen. You can't just wake up one morning and say, it's all going to be a new day. 
No, souls need to be changed in their behavior. It takes time. The souls are so big and so powerful, you can't just do it overnight like that. Try breaking a bad habit or starting a new habit. That's not going to go well. Who's going to win that battle? The, the cruise ship is in control and not the captain. But the captain can cooperate with the soul if they, are, if they wisely work together. So the more we understand how powerful souls are, the more better we are able to manage it and cooperate with it. We can be partners in God's ministry if we understand how powerful our souls are. We can be a partner with God's blessing. But there's one more matter that we really need to understand better before we move on. We need to understand this about our soul. The corruption of the soul. The corruption of the soul. The Apostle Paul takes us through, through a brief logical argument about our soul and how it relates to the law of God. And so listen to this passage from Romans chapter 7, verses 14 through 24, and see if you come to the same conclusion that Paul arrives at. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh, sold into bondage to sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law of God, confessing that the law is good. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, on the one hand, I myself, with my mind, am serving the law of God, but on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. Through a sequence of logical steps, Paul has proved for us two very important points, two facts about the soul. First, Paul note that Paul says that his flesh is at war with the part of Paul which understands and comprehends right from wrong. There is a war going on in his life, and that war, is a sep he says, is a separation. There's a part of me that wants to fight the law of God, and there's part of me that wants to obey the law of God. There's a war going on. So this is that point I made earlier, that you need to look at yourself as an apartment that has a small little you that's verbal inside of you, and a big part of you that's nonverbal inside of you, and is very powerful and large. This is what Paul is discovering in his life. He sees that this soul is part of his body, this flesh is part of his body, and in his members of his body, he's experiencing this battle. This is why Paul says, no longer am I the one doing it. No longer am I the one doing it. Now, to make matters worse, the other point is this. Paul's conscious part of himself, the mind and spirit part of himself that knows right from wrong, doesn't have the power to constrain or suppress the corrupt behavior of his soul. That is why Paul says he is sold into bondage of sin. He is a prisoner to sin, and he is unable to break loose and free of it. So not only do our souls help us with, the auto, with automating a lot of functions in our lives, and not only do souls help us form the basis of our temperament and personality, not only do our souls adapt and uh, accommodate so many things that we encounter in life and get around them and figure out what normal is again, not only does souls have a strong power and latch on to normal and hold on with dear life. Not only that, but our souls are also corrupt, which makes matters so much worse. Our souls are at war with the moral side of our beings. And that ultimately is a war against God himself, the creator of all moral laws. In the next part of our series, we'll identify the exact cause of our own souls, sin and corruption, and then document the many ways it has affected our lives. But until then, know for sure right now that God understands your own soul's damnation and the guilt that's upon it and the curse of death, which will be ours unless something is done. God has been working on a plan throughout all of history to free us and separate us and solve this problem of the curse of death, 
which is on us. He loves us and cares for us so much that he wants us to be set free. He has a plan. And even in this life, he will set us free from the bondage of sin that has a stranglehold on our life. That plan is Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ died for us on that cross, he took with him our sin and guilt and shame to that cross. He died in our place and he freed us from the curse of death so that we would no longer be responsible for the sin that's in our lives. He set us free. He is now also giving us his brand new resurrection life within us by the power of his Holy Spirit to live with inside us and bring us redemption, transformation, regeneration from the inside out. And this is a sanctifying work upon our souls to help us be pure so that we can be the children of God as he intended. Are you tired of being a slave to sin and bear this uh, weight of guilt upon your shoulders that feels like a ton of bricks? Are you tired of all the weight and this battle, that this battle is for your eternal soul and its destiny? Well, God has a solution. Call upon Jesus. Repent and turn your life over to him. Take responsibility for what you've done, what your soul has done. Take responsibility for it and give it to God. Share with it with God and he will provide you Jesus Christ. His life will set you free. Discover freedom when you commit your life to Jesus. Heavenly Father, I pray for every soul with my, within my hearing right now that they have found this freedom that Jesus Christ offers that will set us free from corruption and sin and give us a plan for eternity that saves us from death. This I pray in Christ's name. Amen.